Okay, just make sure the pages are in the right number there. We're ready? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, good morning and uh, hello everyone. I'd like to gratefully acknowledge that we are gathered on the territory of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish peoples. I'm Mike Farnworth, the Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General for British Columbia. We all know that we're facing a major health crisis with COVID-19, a global pandemic. This is a challenging time for all British Columbians. And I want to relay our government's gratitude to the large majority of people who are following the guidelines of the public health officer and helping our province to flatten the curve. But since the pandemic began in British Columbia five weeks ago, there have been suspected overdose deaths in Victoria and many more here in Vancouver. Just this week, two more people died in Victoria's Topaz Park. This is unacceptable. Far too many people are being lost to addictions. And while the fear of COVID-19 sweeps through our communities, we must also remember there are those who are facing this pandemic without shelter and without the support which many of us take for granted. These are people with no place to isolate, no rest or relief from this growing global threat. We have heard from the cities of Vancouver and Victoria We've heard from neighborhood residents and associations, religious leaders, support workers, counselors, advocates, friends, and families that the situation is unacceptable. And we're listening. We are at the confluence of two of the most challenging health emergencies our province has ever faced. And we cannot leave our most vulnerable behind. The time to act is now. That is why today I am enacting an order in coordination and collaboration with local governments and service delivery partners. It's taking place under the Emergency Program Act and as part of the current provincial state of emergency. The province of British Columbia has developed in consultation with the cities of Vancouver, Victoria, Associated Police, Fire and other agencies non-government organizations and stakeholders, a comprehensive plan to make sure that those in the tent encampments in Vancouver's Oppenheimer Park, Victoria's Topaz Park, and along the Pandora Corridor are provided safer accommodation to isolate during this pandemic. And the opportunity, with our support, to lift themselves out of poverty and to break the cycle of addiction. To be clear, this is a public safety order, not a health order, as this situation has a lot of complicating factors beyond just being a health emergency. And as an order under the Emergency Program Act, police and other compliance fish officials are able to enforce any violations of this act. We know there will be big challenges ahead. And we know that this needs to be done carefully, the right way, with wraparound health and social supports. That's why I'm joined today by Shane Simpson, Minister of Social Development and Poverty Reduction, and Judy Darcy, Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Our governments will lean heavily on their experience and expertise. Minister Simpson. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that we are here on the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations and to thank them for that opportunity. Um, I want to start by acknowledging the recent tragedies in Topaz Park and the downtown east side. This week, we lost two people in Topaz Park and an infant in the downtown's east side. And my condolences do go out to their families, their friends, and their communities. I'd also like to acknowledge the efforts of all of our frontline workers who are taking care of us throughout this crisis. Both, we see it with, with health workers, nurses, doctors. Uh, we see it with those who uh, support the supply chain in grocery stores and pharmacies and others. And for me, I also want to express my support for the people within government 
who are dedicated and delivering those supports and making our services work. Whether it's those who worked to make sure we had a successful check issue day uh, for people on income and disability assistance moving forward, or the many organizations like BC Housing, other ministries, people in the community and servicing, uh, providing organizations who have been supporting the most vulnerable people in our province. We know that we need to do everything that we can to protect, protect and support our most vulnerable people, including those experiencing poverty and chronic homelessness. As a first $300 of additional crisis supplement on the April, May and June checks, as well as support through the federal CERB program. This measure has provided some level of financial support. We need to do more. Premier Horgan brought together members of the Cabinet to put together an all-of-government plan that builds on the foundational work of Minister Selena Robinson and BC Housing that has put in place uh, the initiatives that we are going to build on and that we will announce today. We have been funding and building thousands of units of housing province-wide, housing that is designed to bring people off the street and to provide them with secure accommodation. We have been supporting people on the street uh, over the last three years since this government came into place. We know that we need to do more, and we know the COVID-19 crisis has accelerated this already urgent situation. So today, under the order that Minister Farnworth uh, has issued, I'm announcing that we are preparing to dismantle encampments in Oppenheimer Park in Vancouver and along Victoria's Pandora Avenue and Topaz Park, and to bring the residents of these camps inside, primarily into hotel rooms and also into other accommodation uh, supports that will be made available. These encampments present an elevated risk of an outbreak of COVID-19 in these communities. It's becoming increasingly difficult, if not impossible, to follow the provincial health officer's directions on physical distancing, on important hygiene practices, and quarantining for those who may be feeling any symptoms of sickness. Adding to our concerns, healthcare workers have withdrawn services from the encampments for safety reasons. We are taking necessary steps to support people's transition from unsafe, dense encampments into temporary safer accommodations with space to self-isolate, access to hygiene facilities, and important wraparound health care and social services. This work will be done in partnership with the City of Victoria and the City of Vancouver. Since the beginning of this crisis and before, BC Housing has been working around the clock to secure over 1,700 new spaces to house people in communities throughout the province. This includes 324 spaces in Victoria and 686 spaces in Vancouver. People will continue to receive daily meals and medical care when needed. Facilities will also be equipped with cleaning services so that they remain safe and hygienic. We're looking at how to accommodate the safe transfer of people's belongings, to provide safe supply, and honour the preferences and needs for friends and family to be housed together or close by. Many of these spaces will be in emergency response centres and hotels, and will serve as interim housing and shelter solutions to prevent the spread of COVID-19. We will use these sites until we can provide more permanent housing options to keep people supported far beyond the time of the pandemic. I want to take a moment to speak directly to the people in Oppenheimer Park, Topaz Park and on Pandora Avenue. I want to acknowledge that this will be welcome news for many people in the encampments, but it will also cause anxiety and hesitation for others. Our priority is your health and safety. We are doing everything that we can do to make sure you land in a safe, sustainable, comfortable place with the support services you need. I know that this may seem uncertain, and I know that while there are lots of dangers in encampments, there is also a sense of community. This transition will not happen overnight, 
It will be done with care and compassion, and it will be done over a period of transition. You will not be alone, and you will not be abandoned. Now is the time we must continue moving forward with bold measures to house our most vulnerable people and to do so in a way that creates long-term healthy solutions. The order today is the first step to make that happen. In the following days and weeks, we will be providing updates on next steps and details how wraparound health care and support services will work. We are working with our community partners to make a difference throughout the entire community. For example, we are investing in cleaning and thousands of meals each day to support those living in private SROs in the downtown east side. We are supporting the work of peers and thinning out shelters to ensure better physical distancing that is about bringing healthy living to these communities. It is a very large undertaking, but together with the support of our partners, we can keep our most vulnerable people safe and secure during this time of crisis and beyond. I do want to make one personal comment. I grew up in the downtown east side, I grew up in that community and I know it well. And that has been brought important perspective for me. But I want to acknowledge our colleague, Minister Mark, uh, Melanie Mark, the MLA for the area, uh, who also grew up in that community and has been a strong advocate for the downtown east side and whose insights and commitments and values have supported this program and who will be a strong voice and partner in these efforts moving forward. I'd like to thank uh, you all for listening, and now I'd like to invite my colleague, Minister Darcy, the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions, to talk about the important work her ministry has been doing and how that work will support this initiative. Thank you so much, and let me also begin by acknowledging that we're on the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish First Nations. Good morning, everyone. I'm Judy Darcy, the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions, and I want to begin by acknowledging how, what an incredibly difficult time this is for so many people. We are dealing with one public health emergency on top of another, a pandemic that is unprecedented in our time, and an achingly long fentanyl poisoning crisis four years long. It is a crisis rooted in stigma, and it's a crisis with social, economic, and health inequities in the foreground. We have lost a staggering number of our friends and neighbors and loved ones in this crisis, over 5,000 since 2016. And so many families and communities have suffered unimaginable grief. And while the number of deaths began to go down last year, we continue to lose two to three people every day, and we are at risk of losing more. And now the overdose crisis has been compounded by the global uh, cor coronavirus pandemic that has changed everyone's lives in this province. We know that everyone needs to do their part to slow the spread. Everyone needs to do their part to flatten the curve. But when you are homeless or precariously housed, or if you're dealing with an addiction or a serious mental health challenge, if you are struggling just to survive every day, trying to meet the physical distancing guidelines feels practically impossible. And while we know that mental health and addictions affects people from all walks of life, there is no question that people who are homeless and living in encampments often experience greater mental health and addiction challenges than people who are safely housed. They face more stigma and more judgment than almost any other group in our society. I know that many people who are homeless feel invisible, forgotten. We're here today to say, we see you, we hear you, and we're taking action to support you. Today's announcement is a profound commitment that we will do everything we possibly can to keep you safe in the face of two public health emergencies, but today's announcement is also about greater hope for the future. We have been working at breakneck speed across all levels of government and with our community partners, large and small, to be ready so that people who are now in the encampments can rest their heads at night in a warm, dry, safe place. To be ready so that mental health and addiction supports will be there through this pandemic and beyond. 
That means social workers, doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners, outreach workers, mental health clinicians, peers and others will be at each site to help people stay safe, feel supported, and get the care that they need. And these teams will also offer a vital connection during a time when knowing that someone is there for you is more important than it's ever been before. For people with, living with addictions, these teams can help people create a manageable treatment plan to stabilize their lives, to help to ease the symptoms of withdrawal, connect them to resources in the community, and very importantly, be there to listen and support them without judgment. And we will continue to escalate our overdose response, both to save lives from fentanyl poisoning and very importantly, to connect people to treatment and to recovery. Last month, the province of BC announced new clinical guidelines to help people at risk of overdose, withdrawal, infection, and COVID-19 get safer prescription alternatives to the poison drug supply on the street. And this includes safer alternatives for people with addictions to alcohol, to, to nicotine, to opioids, tobacco, stimulants, and other substances. These guidelines outline how people can get their prescriptions more easily through virtual care, flexible delivery by pharmacies, longer carries of medications, and other measures. Because nobody should have to risk their life to get the medication that they need. We're also working to ensure that access to essential health care, like overdose prevention services, remain, remain available and safe for people who need it throughout this pandemic. And we have significantly increased access to counseling for the most vulnerable groups in the province, as well as virtual counseling supports for all British Columbians at this difficult time. This is a critical part of our work to build a full continuum of mental health and addictions care for all British Columbians. I want to thank Minister Simpson and Farnworth and also Minister Selena Robinson and Minister Melanie Mark um, and the entire team that has worked so, so hard to make these opportunities available because everyone deserves a chance to find a pathway to healing and a pathway to hope. And having a roof over your head, having access to food, having access to health care and social supports are all essential to finding that pathway to hope. As we stare down two public health emergencies, we're saying we don't want anyone to be left behind because the only way we will get through this is together. Thank you, ministers. We will now start taking questions. A couple of reminders for the media. Media will be limited to one question, but if you do have a follow-up, please queue up again by pressing star one, and time permitting, we will be happy to take these. Also, please keep your phones unmuted. You will not be heard unless we call out your name. We will begin today with Ahmad Agahi from CTV. Ahmad, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I think at this point, um, we believe that uh, the vast majority of people are going to move willingly. We're hopeful of that. Uh, we have teams in uh, the parks uh, in both cities now. They've been there for, for days uh, working with people. We're using peer supports uh, to engage along with BC Housing and Health and other officials. And we're going to work and focus very much over the next couple of weeks to move people who are willing to move, to try to keep those networks and communities together uh, as we move forward. And there'll be an evaluation. There is a, a second order there, but we'll have an evaluation in the next couple of weeks, uh, knowing that uh, it is our intention to fulfill and complete this work uh, by the end of May. Uh, but uh, at this point, uh, we're very much focused over the next couple of weeks to work with the people in the park, to work with community and get people out. Thank you. The next question is from Lisa Cordasco, CHLY. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, congratulations on this very worthwhile initiative. Uh, I'm sure many 
many, many people will watch in it. Um, would you say it would be larger than that initially to move and provide safe housing for this population? And also, what is preventing you from doing the same uh, for other communities in crisis like Nanaimo? Well, um, thank you for that. Uh, this is the largest initiative. I know talking to the folks at BC Housing, talking to Minister Robinson, who through her ministry with BC Housing has led these initiatives in a number of cases that yes, the combined effort on three sites between Victoria and Vancouver is the largest initiative uh, uh, that we've undertaken. And we put this together in a couple of weeks, not a couple of months. And that's really a testament to the level of cooperation from health officials, local municipal officials, people in the community, uh, supports from First Nations uh, uh, service providers and others uh, as we move forward. So it is a, a, a large um, challenge. Uh, there will be some bumps in the road, but we're committed to addressing those together uh, and ensuring the success of this program. Uh, there are issues in a number of other communities around homelessness and street entrenchment in British Columbia, and we know that. Uh, and Minister Robinson, uh, is talking to officials in those communities to assure them that uh, we will meet those needs. You should know that BC Housing has acquired 1,700 units at this point and the number continues to grow across British Columbia so that we can meet needs in other communities. The reality here in Victoria and Vancouver is these uh, are so large and they're at crisis proportion and we need to address these now. But I do want to assure those other communities we are not ignoring ignoring them, we are not forgetting them, uh, and we'll be working with uh, community leaders uh, and, and elected officials in those communities to, uh, on the issues that are important to them around homelessness and street entrenchment as well. Thank you. The next question comes from Julian Colsett, Czech News. Julian, can you hear us? Yeah, thank you. Well, I'll, I'll get Minister Darcy to, to uh, deal through the details, uh, but absolutely we know this is a critical piece. We need to make sure people have food. We need to make sure that they have their health needs met, including mental health and addictions, and they have safe housing, and that the organizations that provide support are well enough supported to help deliver those. Um, on the particulars around uh, the mental health and the addiction and safe supply, I'd ask Minister Darcy to outline that. Thank you, Shane. Um, certainly, from we were very, very quick to ask, act as soon as the federal government issued exemptions to the Federal Controlled Substances Act, acted on um, March 25th, which was the first possible opportunity, and we have been aggressively getting the word out to physicians, to nurse practitioners, to prescribers, to housing providers, um, community agencies, uh, people who represent people who uh, use drugs. We've been getting the word out very widely. The BC Centre on Substance Use has has been doing uh, webinars. One had 400 uh, practitioners on it. And certainly the, the health resources, the mental health and addiction resources that we will have on the ground as people are moved will include working with them to get access uh, to safe prescription medications as an alternative to the poison drug supply. That work has already been happening in the downtown east side. It's already been happening in Victoria. Um, but there will be dedicated resources that will work with the health teams and the housing teams on the ground in order to ensure that those people who want to get access to safe prescription medications are able to get it. Thank you. And the next question comes from Sam Fenn Crackdown. Go ahead, Sam. Well, I think what I would say is we've stressed the role that 
community collaboration and meeting the needs of people who are living in, in these three sites at Pandora, Topaz, and Oppenheimer. And that's the focus and our emphasis. It's bringing in peers. It's bringing in healthcare workers. It's bringing in community integration specialists from my ministry. It's identifying people's needs and working with them to meet those needs moving forward in terms of where they're housed, in terms of ensuring that their goods and, and, and possessions are protected, of assessing their health needs and their other social needs and ensuring that we can meet those. That has been the priority from day one. Uh, police have an important role around public safety. We know public safety is a significant issue at all of these sites and police will be there to support that public safety both for the residents of those sites and for the people who are coming and working on the sites. At the end of the day, uh, we're going to address and, 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 and take these sites down by the middle of May and uh, the police will play a role in that. But the police would be the first to tell you that they're interested in making sure that this is done in a compassionate way, but in a way that is safe for people. Lindsay Kynes, Victoria Times, go ahead, please. Uh, we have, uh, at this point, uh, we have 324 spaces uh, identified. Um, we have upwards of potentially up to about 350 people identified between the sites. We are actively ac acquiring other sites. Uh, we're working with hotel associations, with private hotel owners, and with local government to look at hotels, to look at community centers, to look at other spaces. Uh, we're very confident that we will acquire those spaces through cooperation, through lease agreements uh, to be able to move forward and absolutely confident that as we do this, and as I noted, it is a transitionary process. We'll be looking to take 15, 20 people a day out every day uh, to house them, to ensure their needs are met, to stabilize them, and to ensure that it allows staff to have the capacity to make that transition work. So we're very confident we will have the spaces that we need to meet people people's needs. Thank you. Up next is Lisa Yudza, News 1130. Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, we have, these are being done by lease agreements, the hotels. We have community centers, for example, in Vancouver uh, that you're aware of, Coal Harbor and Roundhouse. Uh, we have eight hotels in Vancouver as well uh, that will be used uh, for different aspects of this. They are done by lease agreements. Uh, they're lease agreements that we've got at, uh, at, at a very uh, affordable price. But they provide also the opportunity that they are providing some revenue to those hotel owners and they are providing work and, uh, for the staff. For example, we have one hotel in Vancouver that is 59 units. They typically have 11 people who work at that hotel. We're able to retain nine of those people. Uh, they continue to work because of this initiative and they will now work and be paid by the nonprofit service provider who are there, but they'll keep their work and they'll work in conjunction with the health and social service providers uh, who will be at that facility. So we're helping the, that sector of the hotel industry that obviously don't have typical guests. We're making sure that some people keep their jobs and keep working and getting paychecks. And we've done this in a collaborative way with hotel associations, with owners and with the cities. Thank you. And another reminder to the media, please do press star one to line up for questions. We have Juan Palmer, Vancouver Sun next. Juan, go ahead, please.
Uh, that's, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of start and back up there. Um, that has happened over the last period of time. We know there have been public safety risks uh, increasingly and people not feeling safe on those sites. Um, I'll have to, uh, Vaughn, get you uh, the, the specific details about numbers. I don't have those uh, with me uh, right now. Um, uh, what I would say about the orders is that we know that the Public Health Office has already put in place the orders uh, around distancing, around hygiene, and around those matters. So those orders are there already and this is about orders that help to ensure we can fulfill those objectives and I'd ask Minister Farnworth if he wants to talk a little more about the decisions that were made about how this order was crafted. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> uh, so as, uh, as Minister Simpson just stated, the uh, provincial health officer has laid out the health side of uh, things in terms of social distancing and uh, the, the provincial health orders that, that will make those happen. At the same time, what we've seen uh, at Oppenheimer Park and Topaz Park has been a, a complexity added um, by uh, an increasing uh, issues around, uh, around public safety. Uh, not only in the neighborhood in the vicinity, but also in the encampments themselves. Uh, police have, uh, on numerous occasions, uh, had to deal with issues of either assault, uh, uh, violence. Uh, we saw a, uh, a murder take place at one of the camps in Oppenheimer Park, but also things such as weapons um, being found, significant weapons being found, and all of these have created an atmosphere uh, and a tension uh, that has, in part, uh, contributed to some of the challenges that uh, healthcare workers were faced, and so that the the most appropriate way to deal with that is through uh, an order under the uh, Emergency Preparedness Act. Thank you. We have Nadia Stewart, Global, next. Well, I th uh, a couple of things. One is, is clearly uh, the situation has elevated with the health crisis related to the pandemic. Uh, we also know that uh, for us as government, uh, this created a circumstance where y you'll be aware uh, the, uh, the site uh, was uh, under the authority of the Vancouver Park Board. Uh, the Vancouver Park Board and the city uh, were looking at how to address issues um, in Oppenheimer moving forward. Uh, they were not able to resolve those questions at that point. Uh, we continued to look at what was the elevating crisis, or as Minister Darcy said, the dual health crisis that was in front of us. Uh, at Premier brought uh, the cabinet together, a cabinet committee uh, and senior officials of the government. We talked about this and the direction was taken that this was an issue that we simply could not, uh, that we needed to address. And because of the, quite honestly, because of the circumstance with COVID-19 and the emergency state of affairs in British Columbia, uh, we have the opportunity uh, with, I would say, having talked to the Park Board, uh, they're certainly their understanding. Uh, that we were going to intervene uh, under the authority of the, uh, uh, of the order that uh, Minister Farnworth put in place today uh, to be able to act. And we have that ability to do that under that order. So it really was us f having the chance to do this. Prior to this, it was a Parks Board uh, uh, matter. Thank you. We have uh, Brishti Basu from Victoria Buzz next. Go ahead, please. Uh, uh, you'll know that uh, under uh, in March, 
uh, under the budget process. Uh, BC Housing was provided with uh, just in excess of $40 million in order to deliver services around homelessness initiatives. Um, we're in the position now that uh, these initiatives are moving forward. They're being supported by those resources and we have the commitments of, uh, of government uh, that uh, as we move forward additional resources will be put in place as necessary over and above what has been committed. So we're confident uh, of the ability to resource these matters moving forward. Uh, you're correct, these are lease arrangements. Um, we're looking at acquisitions. Uh, we're looking at strategies around uh, like modular moving forward um, with more permanent uh, accommodation uh, resolutions. Uh, and we'll have more to say about that as we move forward. Uh, uh, we have a strategy that's being evolved around that. Today, uh, our focus truly is on getting people out of the park, off of the parks, off of Pandora Street, into safe, secure housing with the supports they need. And we will be working with our, our colleagues in the city, uh, in both cities, and with other community partners to evolve those longer term commitments. Our commitment is we will put those in place. Uh, we have no intention of these people being put back out on the street at the end of this process. Thank you. Up next is Hina Alam from Canadian Press. Hina, go ahead, please. Um, right now, and, and you'll understand these numbers get a little fluid, uh, right now there are about 350 people between Pandora uh, and Topaz on the Victoria side, uh, between uh, Oppenheimer and the immediate surrounding area adjacent to that, uh, in excess of 200 people, the 250 people there, and we have accommodation uh, to meet the needs of all of those people uh, and hope to have all of them moved over the coming weeks. Thank you. We have Les Lane, Times Colonist, next. Initially, obviously the rules, the BCCDC, the Center for Disease Control, rules are put in place uh, around isolation. Those isolation rules will be in place. There will be security on the sites. Uh, we're aware of the challenges that have preceded this uh, and we'll address those challenges with on-site security and 24-hour and services there. Uh, so we expect people to kind of meet the needs around isolation, uh, but people will have the same rights uh, that you and I have, uh, but it will be done with uh, an eye certainly to safety, to security, to ensuring health, and to ensuring uh, necessary isolation, uh, particularly at, at, in the early days. We have Ross Crockford. Next, please. Well, I guess that what I would say to you is that we are very aware of those challenges. We are aware of the activity that's gone on and, and the risks that have been in those sites uh, and the plan moving forward around security, around social supports, around 24-hour services. Uh, we're very cognizant and that we are working hard to make sure that those, in, those uh, challenges that we've seen in Oppenheimer and we've seen in Topaz and Pandora uh, around uh, security and safety aren't transferred to the hotels and that will be a significant uh, part of the mandate and initiative moving forward. The service providers, the community providers understand that. They're very skilled organizations. They have lots of experience uh, operating other similar facilities uh, successfully. So we're hopeful that with structure, with resources, with supports that we can turn the dial on some of that activity. And we'll wrap up with one last question. It's a follow-up from Ahmad Aghari, CTV. Ahmad, go ahead, please. Ahmad, are you still on the line? 
This brings us to the end of the presser. Thank you all for participating.